Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Wednesday, May 22nd, 2024. The House passes a cryptocurrency regulation bill. We'll hear some of the House floor debate and talk about it with Market Watch reporter Chris Matthews. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, who just returned from Israel, talks about briefings he received on the Israeli military operations in the Gaza city of Rafa, and also gets a question about Spain, Norway, and Ireland announcing they're going to recognize an independent state of Palestine. House Speaker Mike Johnson says a bill to sanction the International Criminal Court for pursuing an arrest warrant against the Israeli Prime Minister will come up for a vote soon. Nikki Haley, former Republican presidential candidate, gives a speech on foreign policy at the Hudson Institute, where she's accepted a job on, quote, the dangers of foreign policy weakness. President Joe Biden welcomes the president of Kenya for an official state visit. U.S. Senate confirms the 200th judge nominated by President Biden. Top House Democrat James McGovern forced to withdraw comments made on the House floor about Donald Trump's criminal trial, which the House parliamentarian ruled violated House rules of decorum. And a former scientific advisor to Dr. Anthony Fauci testifies before the House Select Coronavirus Pandemic Subcommittee on allegations he interfered with the subcommittee's investigation into the origins of COVID-19. An article at Market Watch begins, crypto industry insiders are becoming more optimistic that new legislation that would sideline the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission will get strong bipartisan support in a vote this week and potentially even become law by the end of the year. Joining us on the phone now is the reporter who wrote that, Chris Matthews. Thanks for being with us. You also write that the House bill grants the Commodities Futures Trading Commission primary jurisdiction over the industry. What's the reasoning behind all this? So the idea is that because the CFTC uh, regulates uh, commodities and commodity futures, that that crypto assets like a like a Bitcoin or an Ether really fit more in are, are more like commodities than they are securities, which are regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. What practical application does that have for the industry as a whole? So right now, the industry sees the SEC as, as particularly hostile to them. Uh, Chairman Gary Gensler has made repeated statements that he sees the industry as, as um, flouting the securities laws. He's been, been aggressive in uh, putting forward enforcement actions against the industry. They see the CFTC as a little bit more friendly. And also, um, and also that again, that that's what they regulate is 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 more like crypto than it is uh, like a stock or a bond that, that the SEC regulates. This is being brought forth by the House Republican majority. How are the Democrats viewing it, and the Democratic White House? Yeah, so that that's really the interesting thing here. We've seen in recent days a real sea change, whereas Democrats had long been sort of lockstep with Gary Gensler at the SEC, they seem to be defecting a bit, um, potentially because they see this as a, an electoral issue that, that um, oh, there's a lot of maybe single issue crypto voters out there that they don't want to upset too much. You know, that was underscored by the Biden administration issuing a uh, statement on the legislation where they said they opposed the legislation. Um, but that they were that they did not issue a veto threat, and they also uh, stated that, that they are eager to work with Congress to put forward comprehensive reform. Just maybe not exactly what what the House has put forward. You mentioned single issue crypto voters, but I'm not sure how large a block that is. What stage of development is the crypto industry in right now? So that, that's a big question. Um, the industry will put forward statistics that, that really say there, there's huge numbers of Americans who care about this issue. Other more, um, you know, maybe other data like from the Federal Reserve shows actually that usage of crypto has declined in recent years. So it's really unclear how much of an electoral impact this is going to have. The industry is still um, pretty undeveloped. There haven't been a lot of uh, use cases put forward that that would indicate there's going to be mass adoption of this sort of thing. But I think from perhaps a political perspective, the fact that it's unknown um, it gives Democrats some pause about uh, become, you know, going maximally against this sort of legislation. We're talking with Market Watch reporter Chris Matthews. The whole idea of needing to regulate it, what are the fears, the dangers, if it's unregulated? Well, I mean, right now it really is unregulated in a lot of ways. And we've seen, um, because of that, uh, episodes like FTX, which was a crypto exchange that collapsed, 
spectacularly uh, a couple of years ago and um, and other event other events like that. Uh, right now, there is no regulator that is um, that is regulating these exchanges and watching the markets to see if there's any kind of manipulation. Um, you know, the SEC claims right now that it has that authority and that companies are just not. Um, submitting to, to them, whereas the, the industry says we need we need a new framework and we want the CFTC to be in charge of it. If this bill passes the House today, what's the prospect for the Senate? The, the prospects in the Senate are, are pretty slim. I think um, you know industry folks are hopeful that if enough Democrats vote in favor, that that will create some political pressure and momentum for the Senate to take it up. But traditionally, the Senate does not just take up House legislation; they kind of go go their own way. There are several efforts in the Senate to, to create a different framework. So I think, you know, what, what's most likely is perhaps this plants a flag and maybe a guidepost for how Congress will operate perhaps in the next Congress to put forward something that can really get both chambers uh, on board. Chris Matthews, is a reporter for Market Watch. You can find his articles at marketwatch.com and on X at C-R-O-B Matthews. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And some of the debate on the House floor on this bill, starting with Congressman Patrick McHenry, Republican from North Carolina, chair of the Financial Services Committee. This joint effort between the Financial Services Committee and the Agriculture Committee did not come together overnight. Far from it. We've formed subcommittees, convened working groups, heard from countless stakeholders, and received input from members across the ideological spectrum in the House of Representatives. Last July, we passed the Bipartisan Financial Innovation and Technology for the 21st Century Act, FIT 21, out of our respective committees. Each step in this process has created a new high water mark. The next step will be a broad bipartisan vote today to finally provide the robust consumer protections and clear regulatory framework established by this bill. FIT 21 will submit, uh, cement uh, the United States global leadership in technological innovation, invention, and adoption. Unfortunately, our current regulatory framework is preventing digital assets innovation from reaching its full potential. The SEC and the CFTC are currently in a food fight for control of these asset class uh, classes. They've created an impossible situation where the same firms are subject to competing and contradictory enforcement actions by the two different agencies, leaving consumers behind, leaving innovators behind. FIT21 fixes this by creating a regulatory framework that will provide clear rules of the road and strong guardrails for the American, uh, Americans engaging with the digital asset ecosystem. At its core, FIT21 applies time-tested consumer protections to ensure the 20% of Americans who engage in digital asset in the digital asset ecosystem can do so safely, and so more Americans can engage as well. Today, we have the opportunity to answer the calls of consumers, digital asset innovators, and the Biden administration. We can establish the next high watermark for digital assets here in the United States. Congressman Patrick McHenry, Republican from North Carolina and chair of the Financial Services Committee on the House floor. Speaking in opposition to this bill, the ranking Democrat on the that committee, Maxine Waters of California. I rise in strong opposition to H.R. 4763, which I am calling Not Fit for Purpose Act. This bill would deregulate a substantial portion of the crypto industry, taking them out of the purview of the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, and allowing them to operate either under a lighter touch regulatory regime, under the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, or in what I have called a regulatory no man's land. With no primary regulator and virtually no regulations for crypto, that would remain under the SEC's purview. This bill still provides major exemptions from critical securities laws. And if this wasn't bad enough, this bill is not just about crypto. Language was added to the bill after it was marked up by the committees of jurisdiction that would allow even some traditional securities to also exist in this regulatory no, no man's land. 
Specifically, I'm referring to Title II of the bill that defines the term investment contract asset. Assets that fall under this definition are explicitly deemed not to be securities and therefore not under the SEC's purview. But the bill doesn't provide an alternative legal framework for these assets. This represents an extreme MAGA libertarian approach where companies can operate without regulatory scrutiny and consumers and investors are on their own in detecting and avoiding fraudulent schemes. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Democrat from California, ranking member on the Financial Services Committee on the House floor today, and the House passed this cryptocurrency regulation bill by a vote of 279 to 136. It was mostly party line, but three Republicans voted no. 71 Democrats voted yes. On Wall Street today, the Dow down 201, Nasdaq down 31, S&P down 14. From the Washington Post, more than 160,000 student loan borrowers are now in line to have their balances canceled, bringing the total amount of debt forgiveness allowed under the Biden administration's relief policies to $167 billion, the Education Department announced Wednesday. With the election months away, President Biden is lauding the administration's achievements in delivering loan cancellation to nearly 4.8 million people through a mix of existing programs and new policies. Republicans have remained staunchly opposed to the effort, decrying it as a waste of taxpayers' money and patently unfair to Americans who never went to college. That was from the Washington Post. And from Reuters, Israel updated White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on its refined plans to minimize civilian harm in Rafah when he visited the region last weekend, he said on Wednesday. He said Israeli operations to date in the area have been targeted and limited. He also said aid is flowing from a pier in Gaza to the Palestinians there and that it was wrong for Israel to withhold funds from the West Bank. That was from Reuters. Here's Jake Sullivan at today's White House news conference. During the trip over the weekend um, to Israel and Saudi Arabia, um, a senior administration official said yesterday that uh, Israel has addressed many of the U.S. concerns regarding its operation in Rafah. Um, 900,000 plus civilians have fled Rafah in recent weeks. Um, has Israel addressed all of uh, the administration's concerns? Does the U.S. support what Israel is doing in Rafah right now? We had detailed discussions on Rafah during my visit to Israel. These have built on weeks now, as I've discussed with you from this podium, of discussions on a professional basis about Rafah and about how Israel can achieve the defeat of Hamas everywhere in Gaza, including in Rafah, while minimizing civilian harm. I explained to the Prime Minister and other uh, senior Israeli officials the President's clear position. I reiterated that position. I was briefed by Israeli officials and by Israeli professionals on refinements that Israel's made to its plans to achieve its military objectives while taking account of civilian harm. What we have seen so far in terms of Israel's military operations in that area has been more targeted and limited, has not involved major military operations into the heart of dense urban areas. We now have to see what unfolds from here. We will watch that, we will consider that, and we will see um, whether uh, what Israel has briefed us and what they have laid out continues or something else happens. And one of you asked me the last time I was standing at this podium, how are you going to judge this? And I said that there's no mathematical formula. What we're going to be looking at is whether there is a lot of death and destruction from this operation or if it is more precise and proportional. And we will see that unfold. Uh, and we will obviously remain closely engaged with the Israeli government as we go. That's how we see the situation right now. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan at the White House News Conference. He also responded to a question from a reporter about Spain, Ireland, and Norway moving to recognize a Palestinian state, which prompted the Israeli finance minister to announce that Israel would stop making tax revenue transfers to the Palestinian Authority. By the three nations, European nations, recognizing a Palestinian state, is the U.S. concerned that this is just the tip of the iceberg, that we're now at a point where other nations over U.S. objections will uh, recognize Palestine? 
Each country is entitled to make its own determinations, but the U.S. position on this is clear. President Biden, as I just said, has been on the record supporting a two-state solution. He has been equally emphatic on the record that that two-state solution should be brought about through direct negotiations through the parties, not through unilateral recognition. That's a principled position that we have held on a consistent basis. We'll communicate that to our partners around the world, and we'll see what unfolds. Jake Sullivan, the White House National Security Advisor at today's White House News Conference. Story from the Washington Times, House Speaker Mike Johnson plans to speak with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Wednesday about the International Criminal Court's threat to issue genocide arrest warrants against him. Mr. Johnson's Republicans have taken a strong stance against the ICC's threat to Mr. Netanyahu and are inching closer to introducing a bill to sanction the International Court. The details of the sanctions bill or other possible punitive action against the ICC are still on the drawing board. Reporting from the Washington Times, Speaker Johnson took part in a news conference today with other House Republican leaders. Lots of things going on around the world, and let me address first, it's top of mind for us, uh, the uh, the death of the, uh, the passing of Iran's president. Uh, we would just say clearly that the world is a little bit safer place this morning because of that. He was a, a clearly a malign force uh, to the Iranian people and to Israel and the West. While he engaged in torture and terror, the International Criminal Court, I think it's important to note this morning, maybe ironically, they never targeted him or even considered arresting him. But instead, what we see right now is the ICC has chosen to target Israel with baseless and illegitimate arrest warrants, and it's attempting to equate Israel's just war for its existence with the horrific acts of the October 7th massacre. To us, this is just unconscionable. You have international bureaucrats. We're not going to allow them to use warfare to undermine state sovereignty or usurp the authority of democratic nations. America should punish the ICC and put Kareem Khan back in his place. And if the ICC is allowed to threaten Israel's leaders, we know that America will be next. There is a reason that we've never endorsed the International Criminal Court, because it is a direct affront to our own sovereignty. We don't put any international body among, among or above uh, American sovereignty, and, and Israel does that, doesn't do that either. Uh, Congress is reviewing all of our options right now. We have some very aggressive uh, legislation that we're going to push as, um, as quickly as possible. Uh, it will impose sanctions. Uh, and if the ICC moves forward with its absurd warrant arrest or, or request, um, this will uh, this is going to be an even bigger international problem. House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana, at a news conference on Capitol Hill. Again, from the Washington Times article on this possible response to the latest ICC chief prosecutors seeking arrest warrants for the Israeli prime minister and defense minister. Lawmakers are set to leave town for a week-long recess on Thursday, giving Mr. Johnson little time to act. Sanctions legislation has bipartisan support in the House, though Senate Democrats have been cool to the idea. Secretary of State Antony Blinken continued his testimony today before Congress about the State Department's fiscal year 2025 budget request. Yesterday, he was before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and a House Appropriations Subcommittee. Today, it was the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He was asked about Israel's war with Hamas, but also Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The chair, Michael McCall, Republican of Texas, asked the secretary about restrictions on Ukraine as its forces are fending off a Russian military advance in the Northeast. Ukraine. Um, We have a really bad situation going on, as you know. This is a sanctuary zone that the Russians have created. And what they're doing is they're lining up all their artillery uh, and rockets and missiles just across the Ukraine border that they then use to attack the Ukrainians. However, your administration and Jake Sullivan have restricted the arms uh, use so that Ukraine cannot defend itself and fire back at Russia. That's why I mandated the attackums in the supplemental, the long range, short range, and the high Mars that your administration is tying their hands behind their back. Not unlike what you're trying to do in Israel Will you change this policy so Ukraine can fight without one hand tied behind its back? Well, as you know, we've rallied 50 countries over the last uh, two years to come to Ukraine's defense, to provide it with the weapons it needs to defend itself, to push back against Russian aggression. When it comes to um, uh, 
enabling, endorsing uh, attacks outside of Ukraine. Uh, that's not something we've done, but Ukraine will have to make and will make its own decisions, and I want to make sure it gets the equipment that it needs. Well, to you know, Congress got itself. them the equipment, and thank, thank you for implementing that, but Congress did not put restrictions on the use of these weapons. It's, it's Jake Sullivan and your administration that has put the restrictions on these weapons, and I talked to them, and this is not, they cannot achieve victory with these restrictions that you, not the Congress, have placed on them. And I hope you'll take that back to the National Security Advisor and the National Security Council uh, and change this policy decision that is very dangerous and damaging to the Ukraine, Ukrainian people. Questions to Secretary of State Antony Blinken from the House Foreign Affairs Committee Chair Michael McCall, Republican from Texas, at today's hearing. Story out of the independent newspaper in Great Britain, Russia has begun military exercises ordered by Vladimir Putin to simulate the launch of tactical nuclear weapons, including its hypersonic missiles. Ukraine and its Western allies say Putin has repeatedly dangled the threat of nuclear war in Europe since he invaded Ukraine in 2022. The Kremlin claims it's responding to security threats against Russia, such as Emmanuel Macron's refusal to rule out deploying French soldiers to Ukraine. The exercises will involve occupied Ukrainian territory as well as Belarus. That was from The Independent. The Hudson Institute in Washington, announcing a program today, writes, Join Hudson in welcoming Ambassador Nikki R. Haley for her inaugural event as the Walter P. Stern Chair. She will deliver a special address on United States foreign policy amid wars in the Middle East and Europe and growing tensions in Asia. Hudson also writing Nikki Haley would talk about, quote, the dangers of national security weakness. Nikki Haley is a former Republican presidential candidate, former South Carolina governor and former U.S. ambassador to the U.N., now taking this position at the Hudson Institute think tank. It's good to be back at Hudson. I hope the past year made it even more clear how passionate I am about the future of our country. Hudson is an amazing partner in this work. And I look forward to our work together, defending the country we all love. We certainly have a lot of work to do. The last time I spoke here was four years ago. I warned about the rising hostility of capitalism and economic freedom on both the left and the right. I said it threatened our prosperity as a people and our security as a nation. It still does. Today, I have a similar warning. Once again, a dangerous worldview has risen on both sides of the aisle. Once again, it threatens our prosperity and security. We need to take this one seriously. A growing number of Democrats and Republicans have forgotten what makes America safe. A loud part of each party wants us to abandon our allies, appease our enemies, and focus only on the problems we have at home. They believe if we leave the world alone, the world will leave us alone. They even say ignoring global chaos will somehow make our country more secure. It will not. This worldview has already put America in great danger, and the threat is mounting by the day. I have always spoken in hard truths. If we don't remember the path to peace, war will come to America, and it will claim countless lives. We have to prevent war. We have to keep Americans safe. Former Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley at the Hudson Institute today, where she's accepted a position after her speech in which she offered criticism of both the Biden administration and Republicans in Congress. She sat down for a conversation. One of the questions was about the person that knocked her out of the presidential race, Donald Trump. And I couldn't help but think of two names uh, when I heard you deliver that speech, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. So on these issues, these national security critical issues that you've described today, who do you think would do a better job in the White House, Joe Biden or Donald Trump? (laughs) As a voter, I put my priorities on a president who's going to have the backs of our allies and hold our enemies to account, who would secure the border, no more excuses. 
a president who would support capitalism and freedom. A president who understands we need less debt, not more debt. Trump has not been perfect on these policies. I've made that clear many, many times. But Biden has been a catastrophe. So I will be voting for Trump. Having said that, I stand by what I said in my suspension speech. Trump would be smart to reach out to the millions of people who voted for me and continue to support me and not assume that they're just going to be with him. And I genuinely hope he does that. Nikki Haley today at the Hudson Institute in Washington. From the Associated Press, President Joe Biden is welcoming Kenyan President William Ruto to the White House for a three-day state visit as the East African nation prepares to deploy forces to Haiti as part of a U.N.-led effort to try to calm a spiraling security crisis in the Caribbean country. Some 1,000 Kenyan police officers are set to arrive soon in Haiti, part of a multilateral security support mission that aims to help quell gang violence. Other countries expected to back up Kenyan forces include those from the Bahamas, Barbados, Benin, Chad, and Bangladesh. The United States, for years, has partnered with Kenya on counterterrorism efforts in Africa, including battling the extremist group al-Shabaab. Kenya has participated in the Ukraine Defense Contact Group and an international maritime task force launched by the Biden administration in December in response to Houthi attacks against vessels operating in the Red Sea. That was from Associated Press. President Biden and President Ruto met today with CEOs and other business leaders at the White House. Here's, the, here's President Biden. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, Secretary Raimondo, thank you for the update you gave us. And I want to thank uh, all the folks around this table for prioritizing a partnership that I think is really, really important and will, and will deliver dividends for both our countries. And finally, Mr. President, I can't thank you. I think of a better way to kick off this visit. When I uh, visited Nairobi as vice president, I said that the true strength of, uh, of Kenya was its people. Uh, and uh, the students, workers, founders, activists, in innovators, entrepreneurs, and so many people like you who really do d depend on democracy and support democracy. Thank you. And uh, today, as we honor 60 years of ties between our countries, it's clear that our people are the true strength of this partnership. And, uh, and a partnership that's working well. Nowhere is it more important than in the realm of innovation. That's why we have so many business leaders around this table. From Silicon Valley to Silicon Savannah, uh, our people have brought us forward and they've pioneered new technologies that are transforming millions of lives. I mean, literally millions of lives is going to go beyond that. And we've invested in new industries that have uh, generated billions of dollars economically. And they've created new opportunities that have lifted up our countries uh, across both our continents. And uh, our people and our innovators have uh, also brought together. Uh, uh, we are all excited about this. I mean, I've not seen my team so excited about uh, a visit in a long time. Uh, and I think it's all because of the American companies that are here. But uh, oh, I'm not kidding. As and for President, as you and I discussed, uh, we'll discuss tomorrow, we're launching a new era of technology, technological cooperation between Kenya and America, including new exchanges and investments in key fields of cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and semiconductors. And uh, this progress is thanks in large part to the leaders around this table. So my message is really straightforward and simple. Thank you, and thank you, and keep it up. We're going to see more technological change in the next 10 years. I've been saying this a long time, and I mean it, than we've seen in the last 50 years. And we need your help to seize this moment. We really do. And uh, we, need your we need you to help us find opportunities to bring the public and private sectors together. And we need you to help us strengthen the supply chains and industries of the future, including clean energy and e-commerce as well. And we need you to keep investing in the diversity of our democracies, which should make this innovation possible. President Biden and the president of Kenya, William Ruto, at the White House. The White House describing it as an engagement with 10 business leaders representing both the United States and 
Kenya, a roundtable discussion about the technology and innovation partnership between the two countries. Kenya is the first African nation since 2008 to be honored by a U.S. state with a U.S. state visit. And that will include a state dinner Thursday night for President Ruto and First Lady of Kenya, Rachel Ruto. This afternoon, First Lady of the United States, Jill Biden, previewed it. White House writing, the media preview will include brief remarks from Dr. Biden and the White House Social Secretary, Carlos Elizondo, followed by a presentation of the menu from the White House Executive Chef, Chris Comerford, and White House Executive Pastry Chef, Susie Morrison. Sample place settings for the state dinner will be on display. Here's First Lady Jill Biden. Tomorrow night, we mark the 60th anniversary of the United States partnership with Kenya with an elegant dinner under the stars in a pavilion made almost entirely of glass, looking up at our one sky. While outside, night surrounds us. Inside, guests will be brought together over the glow of candles in a space saturated with warm pinks and reds. The night will feature special performances to honor President and First Lady Ruto's love of gospel and country music, the amazing Howard Gospel Choir, and the incredible Brad Paisley. As guests leave their path illuminated by our one moon, I hope they will be filled with the same warmth that I felt on my visits to Kenya, that of a friendship that will endure, helping create a shining and prosperous tomorrow. Every detail of the state dinner has been thoughtfully planned out by so many people from across our government. Joe and I could not have asked for a better team. And I am once again Grateful for Brian Raffinelli's brilliance and partnership. He's a, there's Brian. <laughs> so finally, to bring some of tomorrow's hospitality to today, we'll share with all of you a little taste of the meal our incredible chefs are preparing for the guests. So you all know Chris and Susie, right? First Lady Jill Biden at the White House previewing Thursday night's state dinner. And Maddie Gordon, White House reporter for Spectrum News, posting on X the menu for tomorrow's state dinner with Kenyan President William Ruto. First course, chilled heirloom tomato soup with sourdough crisps. Main course, beef short ribs, butter poached lobster, baby kale, sweet corn puree, and dessert, white chocolate basket, and banana ganache. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi, it's Kayla from C-SPAN. Imagine 45 years ago when there was just a handful of television networks. C-SPAN first went on the air bringing an unfiltered view of government directly to America's living rooms. No spin, no commentary, just pure democracy in action. And it's Greta from C-SPAN. It was a bold experiment. We finally had a front row seat to Congress, the White House, and the campaign trail, all without government funding. As we celebrate 45 years and a legacy of unfiltered access, we ask for your support of a donation in honor of our four decades of service. Your gift, no matter how big or small, will help maintain this vital resource for access to the democratic process. You can help ensure another 45 years of witnessing history unfold and empowering citizens to be informed and engaged in the political process. Visit cspan.org slash donate today and join our 45th anniversary campaign. Thank you for supporting C-SPAN, your unfiltered view of government. Visit cspan.org slash donate today to make your gift of support. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. It's free and wherever you find your podcasts. From NBC News, the Democratic-led Senate confirmed President Joe Biden's 200th federal judge Wednesday, a milestone that highlights a sharp contrast with his election rival, Republican former President Donald Trump, as they seek to shape the courts over the next four years. The Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, spoke before the vote. This is an amazing moment in the history of this Senate and of all Senates, because in just a few moments, the Senate will confirm Angela Martinez to be a district judge for the District of Arizona. 
Judge Martinez will be the 200th federal judge under the Biden administration and this Democratic majority. Reaching 200 judges is a major milestone. Simply put, our 200 judges comprise the most diverse slate of judicial nominations under any president in American history. Our federal judiciary is now far more balanced, far more diverse, far more experienced than it was just a few years before President Biden took office. I'm so proud of the 200 judges. 127 are women. 125 are people of color. That's a majority of the judges, more than a majority, over 60% women, two-thirds. Women, two-thirds people of color. 58 black judges, 37 black women judges, each a record. 36 Hispanic judges, 33 Asian American Pacific Island judges, also a record. It's amazing. And it's not just, there, there's also demo, not just demographic diversity, but professional diversity. It's not just a lot of white male partners in big fancy law firms anymore. It's people who are public defenders, civil rights lawyers, labor lawyers, immigration lawyers, consumer lawyers. We have so much greater diversity on the bench, and that is so good for America, because the bench, the powerful federal judiciary filled with lifetime appointments, should reflect America. It taken too long to get to this point. We still have more ground to make up, but we're getting there and we're so proud of it. And of course, the first black woman to serve on the Supreme Court, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, today on the Senate floor before that vote to confirm the 200th judge in the Biden administration so far. Former President Donald Trump had 234 judges confirmed in his four years in office. From the Hill, Senate Republicans are vowing to block a bipartisan border security deal from moving forward on the floor three months after Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell hailed it as a huge success, reflecting the rising partisan tensions of an election year. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer plans to hold a vote to advance it Thursday, but no Republican senator has yet said they will vote for it, even though it was endorsed by the National Border Patrol Council and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. That was the opening from the Hill article. Groups of senators, both Democrats and Republicans, held news conferences today ahead of tomorrow's vote on the border security bill, leading the Democratic one, Debbie Stabenow of Michigan. On April 2nd, the Justice Department announced the largest law enforcement seizure of fentanyl in the history of Michigan. April 2nd, 40 kilos of fentanyl were found enough to kill every Michigan resident. Pretty serious stuff. On April 21, a Michigan medical examiner raised the alarm on a really bad patch of fentanyl, as he called it, and warned the public that there had been six overdoses in 11 days. These are two headlines from last month, and it does not come close to encapsulate the pain and tragedy of Michigan families who've been, who faced this issue of drug overdoses over the years. So we know we're here because we want to combat the fentanyl crisis and give U.S. Customs and Border Protection the tools they need to stop the drug from coming across the border. And in this bill to combat fentanyl, the fentanyl crisis, it would invest in 2,400 more Customs and Border Protection officers, new and innovative equipment to increase detection, drug enforcement agency efforts to disrupt, disrupt drug trafficking networks in Mexico, and enhanced lab analysis of fentanyl samples. So it has been 105 days, 105 days since a strong, not only bipartisan, you could say tripartisan bill, was brought to the floor of the United States Senate that would make a real difference in what we are talking about today. And it's time for our Republican colleagues who keep going to the floor and saying, somebody should do something about the border. Somebody should do something about the border. Well, 105 days ago, they had a chance to do something. Tomorrow, they're gonna have another chance and we hope that they will join us in voting yes. 
Senator Debbie Stabenow, Democrat from Michigan, at a news conference with other Senate Democrats on the border security bill that will get a vote, procedural vote, in the Senate on Thursday. Sixty votes will be needed to advance it. She mentioned it was a tripartisan effort because Senator Kirsten Sinema, independent from Arizona, took part in those negotiations. Senator Marsha Blackburn, Republican from Tennessee, posting today on X, Chuck Schumer's open border bill allows thousands of illegals per day to cross our southern border and creates for them a five-year pathway to citizenship. I'm holding a press conference today to expose this legislation for what it really is, a fake immigration bill. Here is Senator Blackburn at that press conference. The truth is the Democrats are the party of open borders, and they intend to keep it that way. We are a nation of law and order, and yet the Biden administration has allowed over 10 million illegal aliens to flood our border. That's higher than the populations of seven major U.S. cities, Boston, Chicago, Dallas, L.A., Knoxville, Memphis, Nashville, combined, combined. Under this administration, every town is a border town. We saw it firsthand last week in Nashville where an illegal alien was arrested for allegedly attempting to sexually assault and kidnap a woman at an ice cream shop. There is a distinct difference between Republicans and Democrats when we're talking about border security. The left means release and resettle. When Republicans talk about border security, we mean deny and deport. Chuck Schumer's bill has some supposed limits on how many illegal immigrants can break the law and illegally enter this country every day. But even those limits aren't clear. In reality, What this bill does do is give Joe Biden the license to make permanent his open border agenda. There is a solution to this catastrophe, the one that takes border security seriously, the Secure the Border Act on H.R. 2. On May 15th last year, H.R. 2 was received by the U.S. Senate from the House. That is 373 days. A border security bill has set here in this chamber, and they will not take it up. If Democrats were serious about this issue, they would have started on H.R. 2 last year and have done something about it. What they're doing right now is a political stunt. We know it. Senator Marsha Blackburn, Republican from Tennessee, at a news conference today with other Senate Republicans. The procedural vote on the what was what's being described as the bipartisan border security bill will happen on Thursday. Sixty votes needed to advance it. Another article from The Hill. Congressman Jim McGovern, Democrat from Massachusetts, received a rebuke on the House floor Wednesday after he remarked on former President Trump's ongoing hush money trial comments that were deemed offensive. The spat, which grinded the House floor to a halt for more than an hour, began after McGovern, during debate on a procedural rule, described Trump's current legal entanglements in no uncertain terms, mentioning the hush money case and allegations that he worked to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Congresswoman Erin Houchin, Republican from Indiana, who was managing the rule debate for Republicans, asked twice that McGovern's comments be taken down, speaking over the Massachusetts Democrat as he continued his remarks. That was from The Hill. Here's part of that moment. We have a presumptive nominee for president facing 88 felony counts, and we're being prevented from even acknowledging it. These are not alternative facts. These are real facts. A candidate for president of the United States is on trial for sending a hush money payment to a porn star to avoid a sex scandal during his 2016 campaign, and then fraudulently disguising those payments in violation of the law. He's also charged with conspiring to overturn the election. He's also charged with stealing classified information. And a jury has already found him liable for rape in in a civil court. And yet, in this Republican-controlled House, it's okay to talk about the trial, but you have to call it a sham. We take down his words. It's okay to say the jury is rigged. Mr. Speaker, I demand that his words be be taken down. It's okay to say the court is corrupt. Gentlemen will suspend. But not Trump is corrupting the rule of law. On the House floor today, more from the story from The Hill. More than an hour later, Congressman Jerry 
Carl, Republican from Alabama, who was presiding over the chamber at the time, ruled that Congressman McGovern's words, which he deemed offensive, would be taken down, concluding that a presumed nominee for president should receive the same treatment as a sitting president under the rules of decorum and debate, and that alleging the presumptive GOP nominee did something illegal is not in order. The Hill article says the ruling was extraordinary, setting up a potentially significant precedent in the House where future comments about ongoing legal proceedings could be stricken from the record. New York Post previewing a House hearing today writes a former top advisor to ex-National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases director Dr. Anthony Fauci, who bragged about deleting smoking gun emails related to the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic, will be grilled Wednesday by Congress. Ex-senior scientific advisor Dr. David Morins will testify about his potential violations of federal record-keeping laws and attempts to obstruct a House investigation into the government's pandemic response. That was from the New York Post. Here's part of that hearing. Dr. Morins testifying before the House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic, and he was questioned by the chair, Brad Wenstrup, Republican from Ohio. On October 5, 2021, you wrote... Peter, I just got news that a FOIA picked up an email I sent you saying Tony commented that he was brain dead. I deleted that email, but I now learn that every email I ever got since 1998 is captured and will be turned over whether or not instantly deleted. On June 28, 2021, you wrote, Peter Daszak emailed me and Tony congratulating Tony on standing up for science. That email fell into the hands of the congressman, probably via FOIA, of someone who didn't delete it, as I did, as I did delete all of Peter's emails and others related to origin. Mine was erased long ago. I verified that today, and I feel pretty sure Tony's was too. Dr. Morins, did you ever delete or attempt to delete a federal record? No, but let me explain why it seems to be discrepant. You can't delete an email from NIH, um, you know, from an NIH uh, computer system. They're all retained and can be accessed for any purpose, including a FOIA. Now, I don't know what they normally do, whether when the FOIA is, um, uh, is required, whether they, how far back they go or whatever, but it's my understanding that uh, if they want to, they can go back um, all the way to the beginning, maybe even to... I came to NIH in 1998, and um, at that time, when we came to in, uh, there in 1990, when I came there in 1998, we were instructed to delete emails um, and or to move them into PST files frequently because they jammed the computer. And so I got into the habit of um, every morning, um, you know, looking at all my emails. And I, when I say email, I mean NIH email. Um, looking at my NIH emails, and um, some of them can be dispensed with quickly and then just deleting them. Other ones that I would need to um, keep or thought I might keep would be moved into a PST file so that my uh, inbox wouldn't crash. And, um, and I must say, dep- based on my understanding of what a federal record was, I truly don't think I have ever seen a federal record in 26 years of being at NIH. And if I'm wrong about that, um, I apologize because I, I, it just never dawned on me. I tried, I went to the, I've, I've done work at the National Archives, and at one point about mm, 10 or 15 years ago, I contacted a record person, a records person lady, and said, you know, I have some documents that could be something the National Archives would want. And she said, no, nah, I don't think so. You can destroy it. And I didn't destroy it, I still have it. There's a difference between the federal archives and your day-to-day work as a federal employee, employed by the American people. You seem to know a lot about FOIA. You investigated FOIA. You talked to the people that implement FOIA. Uh, And you need to know, if you didn't, that it is uh, a federal offense if you even attempt to delete something that would be considered for the federal record. Congressman Brad Wenstrup, Republican from Ohio, chair of the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic, questioning Dr. David Morin's former scientific advisor to Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's the former director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Story from Fox News, the Department of Health and Human Services commenced formal debarment proceedings against Dr. Peter Daszak, 
The president of EcoHealth Alliance affirmed that use taxpayer funds to conduct gain-of-function research at the Wuhan lab before the COVID-19 pandemic began. The move took place on Tuesday evening, according to the Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic, and came one week after HHS implemented an immediate government-wide suspension on all funds allocated to EcoHealth Alliance. That was from Fox News. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter word for word, and you'll get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night. 